Welcome to Bible study this morning. Our lesson is entitled Denial and Hope, or perhaps a better title would be Failure and Hope. In the last 20 in the last century and even in the last 20 years, Christians in various places in the world have faced intense persecution. I'm going to give you two examples. Christians may be told to renounce their faith and to renounce Christ or to face death or maybe imprisonment with a possibility of torture. Another thing that happens sometimes is that Christians are told to go against their faith uh, and some belief that they have that they hold dear to their hearts through their faith because if they don't do that, they will face the... Um, full strength of the law of the nation against them. So I want to tell you one example. In 2015, at a community college in Oregon, a gunman entered the campus and he entered a building. And it's reported that he had individuals stand up and he asked each individual that he had stand up, are you a Christian? And if the person said yes, he shot them. Nine men and women were killed that day, and seven more were injured before the gunman was disarmed and neutralized in whatever fashion that happened, I'm not sure. But we, we face a world today where life is uncertain and things in life are uncertain. That's the same thing, or the same way it was for Peter back in Jesus' day. Our main scripture today comes from Luke 22 from verses 54 through 61. And in these verses, we see Peter denying Jesus three times. Before we talk about this, though, I want us to go back to verses 31 through 34 and look at a conversation Jesus had with Judas, trying to prepare him for what was going to happen later that night. So if you will look in your Bibles in Luke 22, and we'll start at verse 31, we'll read several verses here, and then we'll talk about them. Simon, Simon, listen. This is Jesus speaking. Satan has demanded to sift all of you like wheat. He's going to test. all. Satan is going to test and try to get all of the disciples to stumble. But I have prayed for you that your own faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. And he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the cock will not crow this day until you have denied three times that you know me. The reason I wanted to call this lesson Failure and Hope is that here we see Jesus is telling Peter, Peter, you're going to fail. Satan is going to sift you and he's going to separate you from me in a way by causing you to deny me. But, and this is the hope that we have, Christians always have hope in Christ and our only hope is in Christ. And Jesus said to him, once you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. And what this means is that Peter is going to fail, yes, but that's not the end of the story. I was an English teacher, and I like to compare this to perhaps a student failing a test, but then still passing the course and maybe even making an A in the course. Um, so Christians can fail, and we do fail, and we fail Christ, and we deny Christ, and we commit a variety of types of sins. But we know that the Holy Spirit is within us, that he's praying for us, he's urging us to pray and to have Bible study and to continue to develop spiritually. And Jesus is just telling this to Peter. The problem is Peter, I think, only hears the first part of this. And what Peter hears is, you're going to be tested and you're going to fail. And Peter says, oh no. Peter is overconfident. He's naive, perhaps. Maybe a little cocky, but I don't know that that's the case. I think he was just sincere, and he loved Jesus so much that he was willing to go to prison with him 
and he was willing to die with him or for him, and he could not envision in any way that he would ever deny Christ. So he tells him, no, Lord, I, I'm, I'm ready to go with you. But Jesus stops him and he says, look, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. And later this statement is going to come back to haunt Peter. Now I want us to look next at verses, um, hang on a second, let me see. Wrong page. <laughs> Verses 39 through 46. After, he, after Jesus has this conversation with um, Peter, he, they have a general discussion. Jesus talks with the disciples in general again. And then Jesus is ready to go to the Mount of Olives. And he's going to go there and pray, as we know he frequently did. And his disciples went with him. And usually his disciples would go part of the way into the garden and then they would stop at a certain point and then Jesus would go a little further. Sometimes he took Peter and someone else with him a little farther and then sometimes he would go even farther by himself. And this time he says, okay, y'all stay here and pray. And pray that you will not give in to temptation. Pray for that strength against temptation. Pray that you will not be faced with the trial that you will fail. And with that, Jesus went on into the garden. And Jesus prayed, and while Jesus was praying, an angel appeared to him and strengthened him. But we all know how difficult that prayer was, and the verses say here that Jesus even, um, uh, his sweat turned into blood, that he was under so much stress when he was in the garden. But the angel comforted him and gave him strength. And then Jesus went back out to where his disciples were. And my goodness, he found them asleep. And he says, what are you doing asleep? Wake up, wake up. You need to pray so that you will not give in to temptation. So Peter has now been warned in a personal message from Christ that he's going to fail him that night. He's been given two chances along with the other disciples to pray for strength from the Lord and for guidance. And they have fallen asleep instead of doing that and that's what leads us up now to our main scripture for today which will be verses 54 through 62. At this time in the garden Judas appears and other people come with him and I think it was interesting to look at the type of people that came with him. A slave of the high priest came with him and I'm looking now at verses 50, 51, 52 and we're in chapter 22. Um, the chief, some of the chief priests came with him, the officers of the temple police came, and even elders came. So there was quite a crowd that came to arrest Jesus. Now remember that Peter is willing to go with Jesus, and he does. He follows at a distance. So this crowd of people takes off with Jesus, who has been arrested, and Peter is lagging behind but keeping them in view. And he's walking along with them, trying to keep up. And he gets to the courtyard of the house of the high priest where Jesus is going to be interrogated and uh, tried and, you know, abused and all types of things that will happen to him. So Peter goes into the courtyard with the other people and Jesus is taken off somewhere. We don't know exactly how far he was from Peter. We know at some point in our verse, verse 61, I think we're going to see that Jesus turns and looks at Peter when Peter makes, his, uh, makes a statement that's very significant, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But Peter is in this place where maybe he shouldn't be, and he's surrounded by people who are not the followers of Christ. Some of them are the people who have come to arrest him. And they've started a fire in the courtyard. Apparently it's going to be a late night or a long night or an all-night type of affair. And Peter sits down by the fire with some of the others. And so let's start reading with verse 54. And we're going to read 54 through 62, and then we'll stop and talk about it. Then they seized him, meaning Jesus, and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. But Peter was following at a distance. When they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, 
Peter sat among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him in the firelight, stared at him and said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else on seeing him said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Then about an hour later, still another man uh, insisted, Surely this man also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you're talking about. At that moment, while he was still speaking, the cock crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. And the verb that was used here for looked, from what I have read and studied, is a verb that means he looked at Peter with love and compassion, not accusatory or angry or anything like that, maybe heartbroken, but with love. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the cock crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. The great thing about the story, of course, is not that Peter denied Jesus, or that he denied him three times, or that he went out and wept bitterly. The real beauty and significance of this story was found back in verse 32. If you'll look back at that one, please. Jesus was talking to Simon, and he said, But I've prayed for you that your own faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. And what this means is that, yeah, Peter failed that night, but this was not the end. As Paul Harvey used to, said, there's, used to say, there is more to the story. And we all know, or many people know, that, that Peter was restored and that he actually was one of the founders of the church. He was a great evangelist and he won thousands of people to the Lord through his witness. But at this particular moment, his witness was tarnished because he denied Jesus and he denied him three times. And each time that he denied him, it was even more intense. When the woman or the young girl said to him that he was one of them, he said, no, no, I don't know what you're talking about. When the next person who was a man accused him of um, being one of them or of not just of knowing him, but literally of being one of them, which means you're one of his disciples, one of his followers. He said, no, no, uh, man, I am not. And when the third man accused him, he actually said he was a Galilean. So apparently he had heard of Jesus's ministry in Galilee and what the disciples had done and maybe knew who they were. So each accusation became more specific and Peter denied each one just as vehemently as he went along. I want us to stop at this moment and think about ourselves. And I think this is uh, really important because we have many opportunities every day to represent Christ. And when we represent Him, we affirm our relationship to Him. And we are telling the world about His, uh, His authority and about His power and about His love. On the other hand, sometimes what we say, the words we literally say, or the actions that we do deny Christ. And it may not be that somebody is going to come up to me and say, Julia, are you a Christian? I don't have to be literally asked that to say yes or no and to deny Christ in that way. But when my, con when my conduct and when my words are in conflict with Scripture, I am denying Christ. And not only am I tarnishing my own witness, but I am demeaning the name of Christ and the word Christian and Christianity in the whole world or everyone who knows me within my own world anyway. I just wanted to give a few examples of what I'm talking about here. Sometimes we have decisions to make and we just go ahead and make that decision on our own. You know, we know from past experience what has worked, what has not worked, or we think we know what's best in this situation, and we just forge ahead and we do it. 
and we don't even seek God's wisdom and we don't seek his will. Now when we do that, are we denying Christ or are we affirming his place in our lives? We know the answer to that question. We are not affirming his place in our lives and we don't even go and pray to him and seek his guidance and his wisdom. We are, we are literally denying him and denying what he could do in our lives if we were only depending on him. Another instance is we profess our belief and our obedience. And, and, and we do many things besides this, but I just chose this one because I think this happens a lot. We lose our temper with family and friends and church friends. And we say things or we do things that are hurtful to other people. And how many times have we said, or we've heard other people say, oh, that's just my personality, everybody knows me. I get angry at everything so easily, it's nothing. Or maybe I have already put up with so much from that person, you wouldn't believe it. He or she's lucky that I only said what I said. So we go through making excuses for what we do. Sometimes we verbalize them or orally speak them, and other times we only think them. But are we just trying to excuse our own behavior? Is it just that simple? Or are we denying Christ by our words and our actions? We can deny Christ in so many ways. If you were here and we were talking, we could probably, and we had a blackboard, we could probably put a hundred ways we could deny Christ every day. But a couple of the ways I think we can are we can deny Him in worship. When we're not really worshiping with heart and spirit and uh, we have not confessed our sins before we come to worship. I think we are denying Christ. We can deny Him by the way we manage our money or the way we use our time or the things and the people that we give up on. Think of all the people that you've just given up on or you refuse to talk to or you ignore or you avoid or whatever. So Paul wrote to Titus about false teachers and I don't think that Many Christians or any Christians maybe fall into the category of false teachers, but this is what he said about them in Titus 1.16. They claim to know God, which of course Christians claim, but by their actions they deny him. We sometimes do that also. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. Now, I don't think Christians fall into that category, but maybe into this category. Billy Sunday, who was a famous American evangelist, he died in 1935, made the following statement, which I have heard attributed to other people as well. He said, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to a garage makes you an automobile. And that's true. Going to church does not make us a Christian. What makes us a Christian is our personal relationship with Christ. All of our strength, our wisdom, um, our faith, our belief, our compassion, our love for other people, all of that comes from God, from Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, Come to me, all you who, are, who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Think about Peter that night, following behind Jesus, who's been arrested. I believe he was heavy laden. I believe his heart was heavy. He was heartbroken. He was horrified. He was going to stand up with Jesus and for Jesus. And I think when he left the courtyard that night, I believe he was even more heavy laden because he realized he had denied Christ three times. He realized what the importance of Christ's words that Jesus said, I've prayed for you, Peter. But I also believe he knew he had another chance. But I believe at this very point, he was very, we say you reach the bottom and then you can come up. And I kind of feel that's where Peter was after he had denied, denied Christ three times and he had left the garden and he was weeping. But that was not the end of the story. And that's not the end of the story for us because we have hope and we have hope in Christ. The only hope for us, for Christians, the only hope for people who are not Christians, the only hope for anyone in the world is the saving grace of Jesus 
and his love and his care and his strength and his wisdom and the fact that he knows beforehand what's going to happen. He knew before this happened to Peter what was going to happen. He knew that Peter would fail, but that Peter would also come back strong, come back as a Christian leader, come back as a great evangelist. So when we fail, let us not give up on ourselves as Christians. Let us know that God is with us, that Jesus through the Holy Spirit is praying for us, that we'll get through it, that be, we'll be restored to our relationship with Christ and that we will go on to do great things, not great in our will, but great through the will of Jesus. We will do things that will glorify Jesus' name. So let us pray, please. Dear Heavenly Father, just thank you for our lesson today in Peter. Thank you that we know now before we enter a storm or a trial, we know how it will turn out. We may fail temporarily. We may not. It may be that we are just sustained through Christ right through that difficulty and we don't falter at all. But we know if we do that the Holy Spirit is with us and praying for us and strengthening us. And we know that we will come out at the end restored to Christ, useful in Christ's ministry again, and with a close relationship, maybe a stronger relationship with our Savior. I just ask you, Lord, to help us consider our lives, consider what we do each day and what we say, and help us to think if we are denying you or not. It would be good for us to know that we denied you. It would be good if we would hear that rooster crow. Oh, yes, I know what I've done, Lord. Please forgive me. So we come to you in thanksgiving. We come to you praising the name of Jesus and asking you to guide us, direct us, forgive us, Lord, and strengthen us. Give us hope. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.